humble mug. So for those of you who don't know, Halloween is probably my most favorite holiday. I love the change of season and weather as we get into the fall. I'm a sucker for Oktoberfests and Renaissance fairs, and I love scary movies. My mom was an avid Stephen King power reader when I was younger, and she raised me on scary movies. Thank you for that, mom. So it may be of no surprise to you that the stretch between September and November just really gets me going, especially considering that my birthday is in November. And now you might be like, Humble, that's three months. Halloween is just one day. Nah, it's a mindset for me. We started decorating for Halloween at my house the night of September 20th, and we were already playing Alien Isolation and then later watching Alien Romulus back in August. And yes, I picked up a bunch of indie games in the off-season so that I'd be completely stocked up by the time Halloween rolled around again. Despite my love of horror movies and games, if you're a little squeamish, don't worry. For the most part, the games I'm covering today aren't exactly scary in the traditional sense that something like Slenderman, Amnesia, or Silent Hill can be with the tension building and jump scares. For the most part, these are games that have a sort of fun spooky element to them, like Goosebumps. So, depending on your taste, I think you might like this even if you're not a huge horror buff. This is more of a trick-or-treat vibe, not really a fright night. That said, some of the games that I'm sharing towards the end of this video are a little more violent and graphic than the others, so if you're looking for something more, shall we say, brutal, or bloody, then just stick around for those. <coughs> Uh, sorry, I gotta be careful with that demon voice. Anyways, without further ado, here are some indie games with Halloween vibes that I think need more attention. I had to first start kicking off this list with Pumpkin Jack, because this game just totally encapsulates the vibe that I'm trying to spread here. Pumpkin Jack is a beautiful action platformer game that marries the vibe and look of something like Medieval with the gameplay of Jack and Daxter. The combat is pretty fun, nothing too complex, just make sure you dodge at the right times and hit them with your shovel spin attack for the most damage. And while the platforming in this game isn't the tightest thing I've ever seen, that's just what helps lend this game a feeling that's reminiscent of Medieval or Jack and Daxter. As you can tell just by looking at it, the environments and character designs are just off the charts, and it's a delightfully charming game to look at with really expressive lighting. Jack as a character is snarky and fun to follow, as he's this really cool anti-hero trickster that you can tell is just doing this whole thing mostly for his own benefit. As far as the story goes, Jack has been summoned by the devil himself to put a stop to this powerful wizard before the wizard can rid the village of the devil's curse of darkness. It's a really nice twist from the usual save the day type of hero story, and I'm hoping that as I progress further there are more twists in the end. This was a game I was holding on to specifically for this time of the year, and so I'm not quite all the way through it, but after playing through it a good bit for first impressions, I have to recommend it because I love the crow companion, it looks like you're going to be getting a lot of different types of weapons, the puzzles are pretty fun, where you play as this disembodied pumpkin head, and it's overall just a real roller coaster of an experience, and a nostalgic experience at that. The boss fights too just bleed that PS2 era platformer design. The only knock I have against this game is that it's $30 at full retail, which I think is a little hefty considering that it's apparently a pretty short game. I got this game in the off season at a much lower price, and I'm hoping that it'll go on sale for you guys before the holiday. If you can get it at a good price, or you're sold just based on the vibe of this game alone right now, I can definitely say I recommend it. <laughs> Another game I saved for the holiday is Demon Turf. Now, right off the bat, pun intended, you probably see how cool this art style is. You play as Beebs, which I'm sure is a pun off of Beelzebub, and she's this young little impish runt that's trying to claim the title of Demon Queen from the Prince of Darkness himself. Pretty recently, the Queen's Edition of this game dropped, which includes a DLC expansion, Neon Splash, and its Tower Mode, which is this high difficulty challenge mode. I started blasting through the first few levels of Demon Turf, and honestly, it's probably what I'm going to jump back into next after I finish making this video. I know it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I personally love all of the experimentation that we're seeing nowadays with 2D HD art styles, and playing as this Paper Mario-esque character inside of a fully 3D environment is really cool to me. The characters you meet have this decidedly Cartoon Network vibe, think like Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, or even a Flash game type of vibe that you would find on Newgrounds back in the day, and I sincerely mean that as a compliment. And I love Beeb's psychic push ability that reminds me unexpectedly of 
Golden Sun. Her hair has this going ghost Danny Phantom type of vibe as it glows blue. And the physics behind this ability is just really interesting. With that said, combat is far from the focus in this game, at least early on, and the real bread and butter gameplay appeal here lies in its 3D movement, which considering that this is a 3D platformer, that was probably a good choice. Admittedly, I didn't quite get it at first, but once I got the hang of it, I felt like I was zipping around everywhere. Beebs can momentarily transform into this bat-like floating eye type of character to get extra height with her jumps, and she can also transform into this little squid when she's in the water. The world of Demon Turf is just a fun world to be in with really wacky characters. Beebs herself has this bratty, edgy, younger sister type of vibe to her where she kind of annoys you but you also can't help but root for her, and the way that this game plays on typical Nintendoisms is devilishly clever. Like walking through fiery hell portals in the place of Mario 64's portraits, or the fact that your little Kappa friend imitates the Zelda noise when you do something right is just really fun. Demon Turf Queen's Edition is another game priced at a $30 starting price, and I promise not every game I'm talking about will be at this figure, but in this case in particular, especially since you get all of this DLC in addition to a beefier story, I really think that price is worth it. With that said, I do see this game go on sale a healthy amount. In fact, the standard edition was on sale on the Switch at the time I recorded this video, and that sale keeps going until October 24th. I cannot wait to dive back into this game. Now, as I promised when it comes to price, you'll be happy to know that this next game is an absolute steal at a price of $5. Recently updated for free to its gold edition, Impaler is this really crazy roguelike first-person boomer shooter with a ton of unique elements. This one I've been playing off and on all year, and while my gameplay may not show it since I'm not great at it, and considering that I took a little bit of a break while I was waiting for the Gold Edition to come out, this is such a fun game, especially at quick little bursts. Being a roguelike, you will probably die again and again, but you gain much in the way of permanent upgrades and unlocks, so it never feels like your time is wasted. There is a whole arsenal of weapons to unlock, and lots of mechanics that I still have yet to fully master. One of the big appeals of this game is what is hinted at in its namesake. You have this ability to summon spikes from the ground to impale your enemies, and this is definitely the kind of thing that would likely put a smile on the face of anyone named Vlad. And if you manage to impale an enemy, again keeping with that sort of vampiric theme, you gain health back. And there's this huge incentive to impale your enemies because your weapons can overheat and run out of ammo quickly. You can bunny hop around the stage like it's Quake or Quake 2, and you have a double jump as well to get yourself out of sticky situations. Using the boost pads like these, you can launch yourself through the air and then ground pound your enemies, which was a little out of place in a first person shooter, but the shockwave it causes is really helpful at dispatching these statue floating head guys. And there's a whole slew of different types of enemies to fight. I love the art style of this game, and the game is currently at its best, most complete state. It is absolutely worth your time, especially for the dollar amount. Impaler Gold is like this 12 out of 10 Doom mod that we could have only dreamed of decades ago. So much attitude and grit and atmosphere. I don't know, maybe I'll actually jump into this first for a couple games before I get to Demon Turf. Sorry, Biebs. This next game I received from the indie developer Zojoy, and it was one that I had my eyes on for months and would have absolutely bought myself had they not been nice enough to send me a review code. I have a very distinct memory from a couple of years ago of setting up this Raspberry Pi with my best friend, and while we were setting it up, he had this craving to play a certain game that he just couldn't quite remember the name of off the top of his head. After some digging, we figured it out. It ended up being Shadowgate Classic on the Game Boy, and he played through the entire thing that night. Shadowgate is a dungeon crawling puzzle adventure series that was really unlike anything else that had come out back then, and while it's not as action heavy or as flashy as something like Impaler, it's well worth your time if you appreciate a strong sense of Dungeons and Dragons like storytelling. Anyway, my experience with Shadowgate has come full circle this year with Beyond Shadowgate, which is a reimagining of the Beyond Shadowgate you may remember, but most likely none of you do remember, from the TurboGrafx CD. While not considered a bad game, the original Beyond Shadowgate was dealt a bad hand by only being released 
on a very underappreciated console, that being the Turbo Graphics. And the presentation of this game also rubbed some of the diehard Shadowgate fans the wrong way by doing away with the immersive first person perspective for a side scrolling point and click adventure type of look. This version of Beyond Shadowgate is the version that Shadowgate fans should have gotten a long time ago. Better yet, it was made by the members of the original Shadowgate staff with the original script that was planned for Beyond Shadowgate all of those years ago, as the Turbo Graphics Beyond Shadowgate was actually this sort of mismatched game that came about after many of the Shadowgate staff left. This is such a cool game from a historical perspective especially, as it's not very often that you see this type of thing where the original version of a game that actually came out to the public had potential but never quite reached the heights that it should have, and then suddenly, decades later, the version that many people were dreaming of finally comes out. Beyond Shadowgate crushed all of its Kickstarter goals, meaning that you can get the game, a classic 90s style guidebook, a comic book, and all of these expansion missions included, like this haunted house level that really brings those Halloween vibes. And I'm happy to say that Beyond Shadowgate is a game that I spent a solid five hours straight on the first night that I got the ability to play it. Beyond Shadowgate is so, so good if you like these kinds of games. And I also have to mention, the music in this game is ridiculously catchy. I've had these songs stuck in my head for a week now. Oh, and you're probably going to die. Probably a lot. But that's part of the fun. Halls of Torment is a game I learned about from my buddy Tech Dweeb. Over the past couple of years, I've become a fan of these endless wave of enemy types of games. Some of my favorite in the genre include Vampire Survivors, of course, as well as Rogue Genesia. But Halls of Torment quickly became my latest addiction in this space, and it's such a fun time that really just rewards your lizard brain. While there are plenty of levels and characters to unlock, all I'm going to show you is the archer and the first level since that's all you really need to see to understand how this game works. You start off being this decent, normal archer, and as time goes on and you earn upgrades, you'll quickly find yourself shooting arrows like Legolas in that one ridiculous shield surfing scene, and then not too much longer after that, you'll be catching enemies on fire and summoning magical death orbs and shooting shurikens out of hammer space and more and more enemies come and it doesn't even face you because you're just so fast and strong and suddenly you burnt like 30 minutes in this little dungeon and you didn't even realize it? This game is so addictive, and it has a ton of achievements for people looking for things like that. There's so much to do and so much to see that there's nothing wrong with taking the back streets. <laughs> Everyone talks about its Diablo-esque art style, which yes, is the initial draw, and yes, it's awesome. But I also gotta give a shout out to its moody, atmospheric music and its sound effects. Collecting those experience gems and crushing little skeleton bones is almost like ASMR to me. Just listen with headphones. I also just wanted to mention that during the production of this video, Halls of Torment exited early access, so the game is complete now. Just another great reason to pick this one up. Oh, and uh, thanks TechDweeb. Rising Hell is a very, very interesting, creative game. Instead of your typical side-scrolling beat-em-up, the Rising Hell team thought of a vertical beat-em-up game. You're literally climbing up through the depths of hell, room by room, enemy by enemy. It's a roguelite where you gradually gain items to unlock new characters, and as you go, you're given the choice between various upgrades that you want to use. Your main character has a slew of abilities from the onset, like wall jumping and even the Mega Man X wall kick type of thing, and it's worth noting that even his double jump itself is an attack in the vein of most characters' up B specials in Super Smash Bros. Your attack inputs are directional based as well, which also gives it this surprisingly Smash Bros-esque fighting style too. Additionally, it has a Devil May Cry-like combo system where you're rewarded heavily for dealing consistent flows of damage, and there are plenty of weapons to pick up, deals to be made, and you can even play the various levels of this game in whatever order you want to choose. The graphics are awesome, and I have to say, this game probably has the best arcade screen and scanline filter that I've ever seen in a modern game. I prefer it with this filter honestly, but if you don't like it, you can always turn it off. Either way, the pixel art is fantastic, the heavy metal music blistering and bursting in the background is perfect, and kind of like Impaler, it's just so so fun for quick bursts. It certainly got my adrenaline pumping, and I'm sure it will get yours as well. The bosses will wreck you though. Get ready.
Right off the hot heels of Rising Hell, I've got to talk about slaying back from hell. I know what you're probably thinking, I had quite the hellish theme going on here when I was thinking up these fun Halloween indie games. I promise that wasn't on purpose, maybe next year I'll do zombies or sci-fi or something. Anyways, Slain is currently my most favorite game on this list, but that might be a little unfair to say because I've actually 100%ed this game. Slain was one of the very first games I bought and eventually beat on my Switch, and I've been waiting for an excuse to talk about it. Slain is, in my eyes, the perfect marriage between a Super Nintendo Castlevania or TurboGrafx Splatterhouse game and an almost Souls-like experience. Learning perfect parries is essential to beating bosses and enemies in this game, you're going to die a ton, and weapon timing is everything. But the platforming and the fact that you're not losing souls or whatever every time you die screams more Super Castlevania 4 to me than it does Bloodborne, and you know what? I freaking love it. I don't know how else to describe it except that Slain is a gamer's game. It will kick your ass, but it never feels unfair or cheap. It pushes you, but it never pushes you away because the game is such a fun power trip. I think that if this game had released in the 90s, it would have been an absolute classic. It would have been way too violent for the Super Nintendo though, so it probably would have been a PC Engine or Sega Genesis classic. The heavy metal vibes in this game are insane, and it is such a triumph to beat a boss and celebrate with a good old fashioned headbang. The graphics are disgustingly, beautifully gory, and now's the best time to play this game because Slain 2 is on its way and it looks like it's going to be even better than the first one. I cannot stress enough how much this game freaking rules. Last, but certainly not least, I have to talk about Mortal Sin. Immediately, you'll notice the art style of this game. There is not a single game out there that looks like Mortal Sin. Love it or hate it, at least you know within 5 seconds if it's for you. I personally love the look of it, and I bought it pretty much on a whim solely for its art style, but I found so much more when I started digging into it. Mortal Sin is a first person action roguelike dungeon crawler, and this game is one that I'm surprised I never wished for before because just saying first person action roguelike dungeon crawler makes my mouth water. The combat options are intuitive and varied in this game. There are treasure chests and dead bodies you can loot for various pieces of armor and different weapons that totally change the gameplay. There are different characters you can unlock, the dungeons and enemies are heavily varied, and every time you play, there's something new that you'll discover and get thrown off by. Like in Paler and Rising Hell, I dive into Mortal Sin for quick bursts, but I think this one in particular has a lot underneath the hood that's left for me to discover. So this game is one I really want to seek some more time into. It has a kick button also, which is reminiscent of this other first person swords and shield game Elderborn, which I love, and I really can't express just how fine tuned the combat feel is, even if I'm not the best at this game. When I first got this game, I was sharing footage of it on Discord with my best friend and he watched me play for the rest of the night. He actually quit the game that he was playing just to watch me play. And I think that's a testament to both how cool this game's nightmarish look is, and to the intrigue that this game's design gives, both in gameplay and in presentation. Mortal Sin is actually a blessing of a game to play. Now, these eight games are my biggest recommendations for the Halloween holiday currently, but I also wanted to shout out Eve of Calamity here too. There are lots of spooky specters and haunted environments to see in this game, especially if you follow Alfred's questline, and after my Eve of Calamity video dropped, the devs went back in and did a bunch of graphical overhauls, not to mention that this game got added to a Steam RPG Fest and it's 15% off right now. So if you were on the fence before about this game and didn't win the giveaway, Eve of Calamity may very well be that Halloween RPG that you're looking for. I can't really tell all the details here as to why it carries those Halloween vibes without giving major spoilers, but if you know, you know. I hope you found something interesting here, and feel free to let me know what games you recommend I check out this Halloween season. Whether it's a true horror game or a game that just gives off Halloween vibes like the kinds that I shared here, I promise I'll look into anything that you guys recommend. I'm always on the hunt for this kind of stuff. Anyways, if you're still here, thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay humble. Thank <laughs> you.